We have a big mystery to solve. So here's the deal, right? In chapter 1079, we were all set up for a big arc climax as the situation on Egghead Island became quite dire. All four Seraphim had been turned against us, York was revealed as the traitor, and the Blackbeard pirates were ominously spotted off the coast. Supermassive cliffhanger, and then nothing for quite some time, because we actually took a 10 chapter vacation from the events of the main story, and then we returned to Egghead Island in chapter 1089, only to discover that all of our problems had been solved. York had been captured, the Seraph implicated, and everyone was having a lovely future lunch as they prepared to flee the island and move onwards to their next adventure. It was a very bold move for One Piece. I mean, to be fair, Echiro Oda is quite well known for having events take place off screen, but he doesn't usually have a whole arc take place off screen. It would be like if we got to the point in Bunk Hazard when Luffy, Law, and everyone else had been captured by Caesar, then focused on something completely different for 10 chapters and returned to Punk Hazard to discover that Caesar, Virgo, and Monet had been defeated, and we were having a nice snow party. Very jarring, but also at this point in the story, very cool. Because we know and trust this crew, they were 100% going to arrive at this outcome. So instead of going through all of the regular motions again, Oda treated us to a narrative degustation, featuring Shanks, the Blackbeard Pirates, Garp, the Revolutionary Army, and the Reverie. It also gives the anime a great opportunity for some filler material. They could genuinely spend half a year, maybe even a whole year, animating the missing events of this evening. But this time, Skip did leave us with several questions to answer. How did Robin and Carl who get so severely injured, how were the Seraphim contained, who defeated York, and just what was everyone else up to this very evening? And there's actually enough clues in both the before and after pictures that give us quite a vivid tale to tell. So here's what happened during the void evening on Egghead Island. As a bit of a background to this entire situation, everything actually began three months ago when it was revealed that apparently York has a Zoan-type devil fruit that allows her to become a filthy rat in order to call the five elder stars and dob in Vegapunk for conducting taboo void sentences century research. Then over the course of the next couple of months, the world government sought to confirm this transgression. They sent agents from CP5, CP7, and CP8 to confirm what was going on, and none of those agents returned. These particular cipher pulse cells were quite notable because CP5 was the unit the Spandam was in charge of before being promoted to CP9, and then being somehow both promoted and demoted to CP0. Whereas CP7 is the cell that contains Wanzi, the ramen noodle fighter said to be their ace. Although it doesn't look like Wanzi was sent with them to Wakehead Island, which is very very unfortunate for us. I love onesie. But it does make sense because they weren't intending on fighting. They were meant to be gathering all of the informations. And finally, with CP8, that was the cell that Alpha belonged to. The strange Califer lookalike who was charged with guarding Jewelry Bonnie and was eventually defeated by that 10-year-old child. The reason I bring them up at all is because Oda doesn't choose these cells at random. We know quite a bit about CP5, CP7, and CP8, but nothing about CPs 1 through 4. So he likes to focus on these ones for some sort of particular reason. Although we do know something about CP6, which is that it contained Jerry, the uh, funky yoga boxer. Anyway, we're getting off track, and honestly, that happens enough during the actual Egghead Island arc as it is. These cypherpole agents were captured by York and held in the laboratory basement, which apparently nobody looks in anymore. The reason why York kept them alive was for leverage, because she wants to become a world noble and needs as much to bargain with as possible. But these disappearances didn't sit too well with the world government, and so they decided to muster a force of 100 marine ships to set sail to Egghead Island with the intention of war. This was going to happen regardless of whether or not Luffy rocked up on the island. His presence look, it complicated things, but the world government always knew that they were going to need a serious force to deal with all of the futuristic weaponry. However, as fate would have it, Luffy and the Straw Hat showed up the day before, as did CP0, which put York in quite a tricky position. So she enacted an evil plan, giving the Seraphim orders to kill everyone except for herself, Stella, and the Cypherpole agents being held underground. So that by that morning, everything would be nice and ready, wrapped in a neat little package for the world government to come and pick up, a very corpsey package. That's not what ended up happening though. And we're here to solve the mystery of what actually did happen. Also, this video is sponsored by Fume, the innovative award-winning flavored air device. So the aim of these phenomenal bad boys is to turn bad habits into good habits. Or we could even go completely habit neutral and just call them habits. No one has a problem with that? Because Fume is all natural, involves no electronics, no vapor, and no harmful chemicals. Fume is just very simply flavored air. It even comes with an adjustable air dial at the back, some uh, funky, magnetic movable parts as well, which I use on a daily basis to fidget with at my desk, because I really cannot emphasize just how satisfying the tactile experience is. And every now and then I just take a good old swig, 
my favorite flavor, which is orange vanilla. Although plenty of other flavors are available. And as of January, Fume have launched the base, a weighted stand to rest your Fume on whenever not in use with a fantastically fun magnet to keep it attached. So you can and should join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash grandlinereview or scan the QR code and use code grandlinereview to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code grandlinereview to save an additional 10% off your order today. And thank you so much again to Fume for sponsoring this video, as it's because of partners like them that we're able to bring you the best fictional pirate content possible as often as possible. So give it a go, I'm really enjoying mine. But for now, it's back to you, me. After the initial egghead hostilities, the crew were gathered on the command floor, which is the top floor of building A. There we saw all of the Straw Hats, all of the Vegapunk satellites, and all three CP0 members. The only people missing were Stella and Jewelry Bonnie. And that's quite tragic because if they were accounted for, then we may not have had to go through every everything that happened next. Like all good horror movies, the group then decided to split up and find the two of them so that they could promptly escape from Egghead Island at Vegapunk's request. And at this point, our two missing characters were in an unknown location within the lab, the Nikki room or the PAW room in English, which is basically the room that contained Kuma's bubble memories. So for most of this evening, Jewelry Bonnie was watching her father's memories, which we would see at a later date. However, during Bonnie's very sad mind film, Stella was abducted and taken to the lab basement. And we'll catch up with him later, but more things first. Several individuals did remain on the command floor, being Luffy, Zoro, Luchi, Kaku, and Shaka, who were promptly attacked by the Seraphim combination of Esper and S-Hawk. Now at this point, Shaka, he had a great idea that he should go and check the basement. Can't go wrong there, so he went and did that. And then a few moments later, S-Hawk vanished from the fight, which presented an intriguing slice of individuality, with Rob Luchi theorizing that S-Hawk was prioritizing eliminating the weakest targets first, which is interesting because none of the other Seraphim seemed to function like that. They all just see target and then relentlessly pursue elimination of said target. So Zoro and Kaku, who Luffy called Usopp, were sent to chase S-Hawk, thus resulting in the command room group now being split into three separate groups. Now right below them is the third floor of building A, where Nami, Brooke, and Edison were attacked by S-Shark. Now Edison, he stood no chance and was almost killed in this attack, as was Brooke. He was almost, well, whatever the equivalent of killing him again would be. So it was left to Nami to fight S-Shark alone until Sanji arrived in the nick of time to save everyone, which is quite miraculous considering considering that his last known location was the second floor of Building B with Jinbei and Stussy. According to the map, that would have been a real tricky location to get to in a rush. Then on the other side of the complex, in the third floor of Building C, we have Usopp, Frankie, Lilith, and Pythagoras, who were attacked by S-Snake. And she proceeded to turn Usopp, Frankie, and Lilith into stone, but killed Pythagoras by crushing and destroying his robot head. It's very curious that S-Snake didn't take this opportunity to kill Lilith as well, because she is also a Vega punk. But I suppose the logic with her orders is that being petrified is close enough. But Pythagoras was a robot, so he was immune to her fruit abilities, and so he needed to be more brutally dealt with. Diagonally below them on the second floor of Building A was the cohort of Robin, Chopper, and Atlas, who, at the suggestion of Atlas, were on their way to check the lab basement. And at that time, in this very basement, were Stella, the Cypherpole agents, York, and for a brief time, Shaka. Because as soon as Shaka arrived in the basement, York put a bullet in his head and revealed herself as the traitor. With the absolute final thing of note being that the Blackbeard Pirate's vessel was spotted arriving within the general vicinity of Egghead Island. So the Blackbeard pirates were here long before the Marines arrived and have potentially been involved with this incident for far longer than any of us realize. That was the big cliffhanger that we were left with, that the grand antagonist was unveiled and we have a very threatening third party presence and who knows what they want. But let's start answering some of our lingering questions. And the easiest one to answer is how Robin got her injuries. Robin's group was already on their way to the basement. So I think it's highly likely that they were the first to encounter York. And I think that York may have simply shot the crap out of Robin, which would have left the entire group in a very bad position. Chopper then can't go and fight York because he has a duty as a doctor to help Robin. And Atlas, well, she could have tried and probably did given how angry she gets. Ultimately though, I think the best move for this group would have been to take the injured Robin, perhaps even Stella if they could, then run and alert everyone else about York as well as Stella's location if they were unable to access him. Another reason why I'm fairly certain that it was York who injured Robin is because Nami gets particularly angry at York later on. While she's captured, Nami even thwacks her a couple of times. Some of which is a reaction to York mentioning Ohara, but Nami only really ever gets this wrathful if a situation involves a child or a Robin. If any other straw hat was injured, I don't think we'd see her acting like this. But our other patient is much more difficult to diagnose. The person who suffered the most during this egghead evening and remained alive was undoubtedly Kaku. And he, very counterintuitively for a secret agent, I should say, told us the exact truth of what happened. In chapter 1090, Kaku says, just look at the state of me. But remember, I was up against two seraphim. 
So at some point during the evening, Kaku was put in the horrible position of having to 1v2 the Seraphim. So the question now being which two and why two? And I have a pretty reasonable answer for the first one, which is that whilst chasing s Hawk, Zoro did what Zoro does best and got lost without Kaku noticing. So that when Kaku did eventually catch up to s Hawk, he found himself surprisingly alone. Now as for which Seraphim Kaku gets tag teamed by, it's probably not s Shock. He has his own thing going on elsewhere with Sanji. And I also doubt that it was s Snake. Only because if Kaku were to come into contact with her, then I suspect that he would have been petrified rather than receiving a double beatdown, which only leaves Esper, who last thing we saw was fighting against Luffy and Rob Lucci. And I do genuinely think that it could be Esper, but that reasoning will become clear once we answer this next question. The question of exactly how the Seraphim were contained. It might sound like a simple question because we see them all trapped in the special bubbles after the time skip, but how they got here is a logistical nightmare because we've got to go through a lot of steps before this is even possible. And there's some very key details that you may have missed in a first read through. For example, at first I thought that the bubble gum was petrified by s Snake along with Lilith because she was using it and traditionally weapons and clothing are also affected by the abilities of the Mera Mera fruit. However, if you look very closely in chapter 1078, Lilith dropped the bubble gum before being petrified, so it was still available for use. The problem being that this group was the most isolated of all of the groups. They were the only ones occupying building C. Everyone else was in A or B or the basement which I think is also an A. So the idea of somebody just stumbling upon the bubble gun for handy use is quite unlikely, especially when everyone's busy trying to put out their own clone fires. The most available group would probably be Jinbei and Stussy, but they were about as far away as you could be on the second floor of building B. And because after the time skip, we see Jinbei looking quite roughed up, we can assume that he did engage in combat with a Seraph, which given his location would most likely be S Shark, which would have been quite a trippy fight. Some Jinbei on Jinbei action. But the combination of Sanji and Jinbei should be be enough to keep s Shark at bay. Not enough to defeat him because we don't know exactly what it takes to beat a Seraph. It's literally never been done before, but it does buy some time for the bubble gun to be found and arrive. The closest people to the bubble gun would actually be Nami's group on the third floor of building A fighting s Shark. However, what we do know is that at some stage, Luffy makes his way to the petrified group because we do have a small flashback showing Luffy asking slash ordering s Snake to unpetrify everyone. And we know where he is because in the background, you can see the broken railing of a bridge, which tells us that they're in the room with the petrified group. But this is the opportunity that I was alluding to before. At some stage during the evening, Luffy stops fighting Esper for whatever reason. Maybe Esper's targeting changes and Luffy gets lost trying to follow him. Or maybe Atlas is able to communicate with everyone and inform them that Stella is in the basement. So there's this renewed scrambled effort to focus attention that way. Doesn't matter. What matters is that this reshuffling of locations would be a prime opportunity for Esper to stumble upon Kaku fighting s Hawk and beat the ever-loving crap out of him. Poor Kaku. Kaku, someone needs to save that guy. Don't know who, but someone. Back to Luffy, we also know that his command to S Snake comes long before this incident is fully resolved. And we know this because of Usopp's face. When he was petrified, he was all clean and undamaged. However, when we come back to him in the group shot of chapter 1089, he has incurred some serious facial damage, meaning that there was still Seraphim left to fight after he was freed. So the conclusion with the bubble gun might be well, quite disappointingly simple. Lilith dropped it and then Lilith picked it back up after Luffy ordered S Snake to release her. At which point, the group put s Snake in the bubble and then systematically bubbled up the other three Seraphim, which leaves one problem left to solve, a very tall and greedy problem named York. When we do see York again in chapter 1089, she's being held hostage by Zoro, which conjured a very fun scenario on my mind that piggybacks off the Kaku situation. So Zoro gets lost on his way to find s Hawk, and with his pathetic sense of direction, he ends up in the basement or wherever York is, some obscure location, at which point it's over for York immediately. She might try to resist, but look, it's Zoro and that might be why the Straw Hats are using him to threaten and contain her. Also, of all of the characters, you know, York doesn't seem particularly injured. The only person in better condition than York is Bonnie. And that's because she didn't actually do any of the fighting. She spent all night in the Kuma room. I mean, York has a couple of scratches here and there, but overall, she's looking like she's in pretty good shape, which tells me that however her defeat was incurred was probably very straightforward and not your typical flurry of fist to beat the villain unconscious sort of thing. More like a quick surrender. Although Zoro gets quite injured as well, so I don't think that would be the be all and end all of his involvement during this evening, but I do think that the events are fairly simple, and that's one reason why Oda may have decided to just skip this one. York wasn't a villain threatening enough to be able to command an art climax, and after beating an Emperor of the Sea, look, a hungry, hungry satellite, that's just not gonna do it for us anymore. But York did serve as a rather clever red herring for the true villains of the arc who arrived the next day. And I really appreciate the way that Oda changed up the flow of this arc, because for a while it was looking like another standard One Piece entry. However, in stark contrast to that, Egghead Island is now 
looking to be one of the most unique and exciting experiences that I've had reading One Piece weekly. And if you want to be the first to know how it concludes, then please do subscribe to this channel to receive consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed.